Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us as we celebrate the week of Earth Day with our first session of the HHS Earth Day 2022 speaker series. We're excited you're here and for the speakers we have lined up for tomorrow or today, tomorrow, and Thursday. My name is Christina Bagdikian, and I'm on detail to the HHS Office of Climate Change and Health Equity, and I'll be moderating this session. Let's cover a few housekeeping items before we get um, started and introduce today's guest. First, these sessions are being recorded and will be posted to the Office of Climate Change and Health Equity webpage. So please make sure you go to our webpage to sign up to our listserv and make sure you get the alert when the session is posted in a few days. Second, we want, to, we want you to ask questions. Please send them to gogreen at hhs.gov as you think of them. You don't have to wait till the end, and then our team will get to as many of them as possible as time allows at the end. And make sure you turn in to tomorrow and Thursday's talks. All right, let's get started. Uh, today, we are happy to welcome Sankita Kadam, who is a research assistant at the NASA Goddard Institute of Space Studies in the Climate Impacts Group. She has a master's in climate and society from Columbia University, and her research expertise includes climate modeling, impact modeling for decision making, and utilizing remote sensing data for adaptation. Her work encompasses studying climate variability and its impacts on agricultural food systems, urban systems, and ecosystems. When you're ready, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for that introduction, Christina. Do you hear me okay? Um, hi, you. everyone. My name is Sanketa. I work in the Climate Impacts Group at NASA GIS with Cynthia Rosenzweig. She's the head of our group, um, and she usually gives this presentation with me, but unfortunately, she's not here today. So today, we'll cover three sections, Introduction to Climate Change Basics, Its Impacts, adaptation and mitigation. So let's get right into it. The terms weather and climate are sometimes confused, though they refer to events on broadly different spatial and temporal scales. Weather tells you what to wear each day. Um, climate tells you what type of clothes to have in your closet. Similarly, the terms global warming and climate change are often used interchangeably, but have distinct meanings. Weather refers to atmospheric conditions that occur locally over short periods of time, from minutes to hours, days to weeks. Uh, some familiar examples include rain, snow, clouds, winds, or thunderstorms. Climate, on the other hand, is a long-term regional or global average of temperature, humidity, and rainfall patterns over a period of time. Usually it's 30 plus years. Um, weather can be affected by things like local humidity, air pressure on a day-to-day -day basis. Global warming is the monotonic long-term heating of Earth's climate system observed since the pre-industrial period between 1850 and 1900 due to human activities, uh, mostly fossil fuel burning, which increases heat trapping greenhouse gas levels in the Earth's atmosphere. Climate change is a long-term change in the average weather patterns that have come to define Earth's local, regional, and global climates. This usually includes global warming, but refers to the broader range of changes that are happening to our planet. Here is a brief introduction to the climate change radiative basis. The fundamental equation to understand is that object with warmer temperature radiates more energy away. So consider a simple setup of Earth, Moon, and Sun. So Moon has no atmosphere in this situation. Energy coming from the Sun is being balanced or is equal to energy going out. On Earth, we have an atmosphere, so some energy is being trapped and directed back to Earth because of that atmosphere. So more energy coming in than going out, and the planet has to warm up to balance or reach equilibrium. This is what we call the greenhouse effect. So current research in climate change is figuring out where does the energy go 
how do all the earth systems take that energy in and react to it? Systems like oceans, ice, land surface, vegetation. And this energy changes the way climate behaves, changes in rainfall patterns, wind extreme events, feedback systems, etc., which in turn affects the society that we live in. So natural variability has always been a part of Earth's climate system. Earth has gone through periods of cooling and warming. And to understand climate change, we need to understand the causes. Natural processes can contribute to climate change, including internal variability, example, ocean patterns like El Nino and La Nina, and external forcings such as volcanic activity. Changes in sun's energy output, variations in Earth's orbit, changes observed in Earth's climate since the early 20th century are partly driven by human activities and particularly fossil fuel burning and deforestation. Um, these natural causes are still in play, but their influence is too small and too slow to explain the rapid warming that we have seen recently in the early 20th century. So Earth's climate has changed continuously throughout its history. In the last 650,000 years, there have been seven cycles of glacial advance and retreat. With the abrupt end of the last ice age about 11,700 years ago, marking the beginning of modern climate era and of human civilization. It's important to note that the current warming trend is of particular significance because it has been accelerated by human activity since the mid 20th century. And that's what the graph on the right is showing is from the 1900 to 2000 and beyond we see an accelerated upward trend in warming. In paleoclimate and ice ages, through studying ice cores, we know that CO2 concentrations during the warming periods that followed the ice ages that we see on the graph here has never exceeded 300 parts per million, which when I checked yesterday, we are at 420 parts per million, which is pretty high for Earth's history. The planet's average surface temperature has risen about 1.18 degrees Celsius since the late 19th century, a change driven largely by increased greenhouse gas emissions into the atmosphere. Observed increases in well-mixed greenhouse gas concentrations since around 1750 are unequivocally caused by human activities. And most of the warming has occurred in the past 40 years, with seven most recent years being the warmest, which 2016 and 2020 were the warmest years. So why does carbon dioxide matter? CO2 is the most important of Earth's long-lived greenhouse gases. It absorbs less heat per molecule than, say, nitrous oxide or methane, but it's more abundant and it stays in the atmosphere longer it's about 300 to 1,000 years. And the graph here on the right shows the heating imbalance caused by the combined influence of greenhouse gases. But what we can see here is that carbon dioxide is so abundant in the atmosphere that it is responsible for about two-thirds of total energy imbalance. And since the 1990s, we've seen about a 45% increase in the combined amount of all these gases in the atmosphere. So prior to industrial revolution, uh, the CO2 concentrations were fairly stable at around 280 parts per million. By 2020, it, they had risen to more than 48%. Following the multiple lines of evidence philosophy, scientists study various systems for evidence of climate change, such as rising global temperatures, warming oceans, increase in sea level rise, shrinking ice sheets, and increase in extreme weather events. Oceans, we know, act as a heat sink, but recently we have seen that the top 100 meters of ocean has shown warming of about 
0.34 degrees Celsius. More than 90% of global warming goes into the oceans, which means that the warming oceans also result in shrinking ice sheets and more sea level rise. Um, it's virtually certain that hot extremes have become more frequent and more intense. The frequency and intensity of heavy precipitation events have both increased. And these are all observations, events that we are seeing right now, today. The impacts of climate change are no longer a distant future. It's no longer 2050 and in the future, it's, these are the impacts that we are seeing today. The global proportion of category three and five tropical cyclones um, has increased. We had an extremely active hurricane season in 2020 and 2021 with record breaking 30 or more than 30 named storms in 2020. Climate scientists separate factors that um, affect climate change into three broad categories. It's forcings, feedbacks, and tipping points. Forcings is usually the energy imbalance caused by the initial drivers of climate, such as solar irradiance, greenhouse gas emissions, et cetera. Feedbacks are processes that can either amplify or diminish the effect of a forcing. So for example, ice albedo have a warming effect or positive feedback. And we can talk about that more in the FAQ section. A tipping point is a point at which small changes become significant enough to cause a larger, more critical change that can be abrupt and very importantly, irreversible and lead to cascading effects. So for example, Greenland ice sheet melting, completely melting can add up to seven meters to sea level rise while Western Antarctic ice sheet melting can add up to 3.3 meters to sea level rise. Um, and on the right here, we see a map of different tipping points around the world. Um, we see the Amazon rainforest, the active sea ice, the boreal forest, the coral reefs, the permafrost, the Atlantic circulation. Passing an irreversible tipping point would mean that our climate system cannot revert back to its original state. Uh, another example that I wanted to mention here is the AMOC or the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation, which is the sea here that we see on the map. So Gulf Stream that is part of this AMOC is being weakened by climate change. Uh, it's a system that brings warm water up to Europe from the tropics and beyond. The AMOC forms part of a wider network of global ocean circulation. Uh, it transport heat, transports heat all around the globe. And recent uh, research suggests that AMOC has been weakened by about 15%. And a complete shutdown would cause widespread cooling around the whole of the Northern Hemisphere. And it can, the winter temperatures can fall by up to four degrees Celsius. But the models are not predicting this for at least another 100 years. And this would require that the global warming level reaches four degrees C and higher. So there's a lot of uncertainty around a complete shutdown of AMOC, but we definitely have evidence that it's weakened and it's slowing down. When we're talking about systems, what we're trying to do is understand the interactions between the components of this climate system. Climate system interacts with oceans, ice ecosystems. What we also see here are the human driven components like land use change, vegetation change. They also have impact on the overall system. They're all connected and they all interact with each other. So climate models uh, represent this system that we just saw into grids and it parametrizes it into equations. We particularly at NASA work on the NASA GIS climate model here at the Goddard Institute of Space Studies um, using supercomputers. 
Um, this climate model is built on principles of physics and chemistry. It's balanced across water and energy budgets. It's dependent on initial conditions and boundary forcing. So we give it initial conditions of the amount of greenhouse gas emissions in the atmosphere, the amount of sunlight received, what is the land use. Uh, it's tuned using surface stations and remote sensing data sets with machine learning. It is independently validated against observed trends in variability, so against observations and past trends. Uh, the models are capable of extending beyond observed conditions. So we not only project into the future, we also project into the past. It's called hindcasts, and that's how we compare to observations. Um, it's subject to limits and predictability given chaotic nature of the climate system. Over time, with more computational power, we have improved our resolution of these models from 1990s to now. We have come, we've come far. We come from 500 kilometers to about 100 kilometers, and we always have more ways to go, but we can also further extend it by using regional climate models and empirical models that they use statistical approaches to downscale the climate model to a more lower resolution. So we go down to up to 25 to 50 kilometers now. And so climate models were designed to understand the response to combined and individual driving factors like methane, CO2, et cetera, but to also understand the impacts of policy choices to get a forewarning of the need of adaptation and based on what's coming. They are not designed for perfect short-term and long-term predictions. So for example, for daily or hourly forecast, we usually look at weather models versus climate models. They are not designed to study truly local information because of the resolution available, and hence begs the necessity of bottom-up approaches when thinking of solutions on smaller scales, and we will learn about this more in the adaptation section. So how can we use climate models? Mostly we've seen that it's been very useful in determining human influence on climate system. In the green here on the graph in the green cloud, um, we see simulations using climate models where only natural variability was included and this shows a stable climate. But when we look at the actual observations, which is in the black here, Climate models only follow this in their hindcast when we factor in greenhouse gas emissions, aerosol emissions, showing the human influence on climate system. Looking forward into the future, we use scenarios to represent pathways of development, technologies, and most importantly, the amount of greenhouse gas emissions into the future. So in this graph here from IPCC, we see that IPCC, that is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, that brings together about hundreds of scientists and experts and policymakers from all around the world. And they release a report on the current state of climate change, the latest science and information. And what we've seen in uh, this is that Uh, the SSPs, which is the shared socioeconomic pathways, which shows you, you know, the scenarios of different income, technology, land use, and government strategies into the future are combined with RCPs, which is the representative concentration pathways that show the uh, carbon fluxes, the greenhouse gases, the aerosol emissions. Um, and this graph uses climate models from CMIP-6, which is the couple model intercomparison project phase six, which is a set of common protocols followed by climate modelers all around the world. And it is important to note that the uncertainty range in each scenario is across models, which is less than compared to the uncertainty range across scenarios. So if we were to have a uh, world where the uh, greenhouse gas emissions were lower or curbed in time, 
we would have lesser warning, warning than compared to the scenario where it's a business as usual. So the red line you see in the graph, SSP 5, 8.5, we call it business as usual scenario. That gives you a higher warming than a world where we are curbing our emissions. So let's, let's look at these SSP, RCP scenarios in depth. So the first one is the SSP 1, 2.6, which is the sustainability or taking the green road scenario, which envisions relatively optimistic trends for human development with substantial investments in education, health, uh, economic growth, as, and well-functioning institution. In SSP 1, there is an increasing shift towards sustainable practices and green practices and the stabilization pathways in which radiative forcing is stabilized at approximately 2.6 watts per meter squared. This uh, simply means that we um, reduce our greenhouse gas emissions and we curb our greenhouse gas emissions. The second is called the middle of the road. The world follows a path in which social, economic, and technological trends do not shift markedly from historical patterns it's an intermediate stabilization pathway in which the radiator forcing is stabilized at approximately 4.5. So, and in a medium emission scenario. And the high is the 37.0, which is a regional rival near the Rocky Road, where countries focus on achieving energy and food security goals within their own regions at the expense of broader based development. And so this is just showing a pathway that a world can take. And depending on what pathway we take, um, our global warming temperature um, is tied to it. This is just showing the climate projections by global warming level. On the left, we see uh, annual temperature. And on the right, we see annual precipitation. The first row shows 1.5 degrees C of warming, and the one below shows 3.5 degrees C of warming, global warming. And in each scenario, we see that there are some regional patterns. We, you can say the dry regions get drier, wet regions get wetter um, on the annual precipitation map. Uh, but definitely, we see that it's not um, it's not consistent globally. Some regions are definitely feeling the impact more than others. So let's get to the impact section. Impacts are noticed across many systems. Uh, nature's crucial services at risk in warming world. You have pollination, coastal protection, tourism, food source, health, water filtration, clean air. Um, these are just some of the sectors that will see impact, but we also see increases in things like wildfires that are being studied on the Western United States, impacts on transportation systems in urban areas, for example, due to increasing hurricanes. Um, these are other future global climate risks. You have heat stress, water scarcity, food security, and flood risk. We know that exposure to heat waves will continue to increase with additional warming, and this has direct impact on health. We know that at 2.3 degrees C um, warming, regions relying on snow melt could experience 20% decline in water availability for agriculture after 2050. Um, California and the Western United States have been experiencing the worst droughts. Uh, in the history in the past few years, though we know the droughts are getting worse and it directly impacts our food systems and agriculture. Um, so we know that climate change will increasingly undermine food security in already vulnerable countries and regions um, in the world. Flood risk about a billion people in low lying cities by the sea and on a small island are at risk from sea level rise but also extreme events like hurricanes and cyclones. Um, here, I wanted to focus on the impacts on health. 
And this is a chart from the recent IPCC report that I mentioned before, which is AR6 uh, released a few weeks ago. Um, this shows the impacts on health and well being by region, the dark blue being high negative impact. And we can see here for Africa, you have high negative impact on infectious diseases. And we've seen through studies that there are higher cases in malaria that have been noticed due to change in rainfall patterns and spatially and temporally. Um, we are seeing the adverse impacts of high heat and humidity on health in the United States already. We're also seeing displacement due to floods and hurricane, which is projected to only increase in the future. Adaptation and mitigation, and what does that mean? But before that, let me just say that despite increasing awareness of climate change, our emissions of greenhouse gases relentlessly continue to rise. Um, and so our response to climate change needs to have a two-pronged approach, which is reducing emissions and stabilizing the levels of heat trapping greenhouse gases in the climate change field, we call it mitigation. And the second is adapting to the climate change, which we call adaptation. So let's look at adaptation. Okay. Action ad on adaptation has increased, but progress is uneven and we're not adapting fast enough. This is according to the new IPCC report released a few weeks ago. Hold on, I think I missed this. I'm sorry, I'm gonna go back to this slide because this is important. Uh, before we get into adaptation and mitigation, I wanted to talk about what is risk and how do we explain climate risk or assess climate risk. It's the intersection with intersection of hazard, which is climate hazard in our case, vulnerability and exposure. Uh, for example, a climate hazard like drought um, the risk that a farm can face will depend on its vulnerability, how it was designed, the economic system, the initial conditions that contribute to its exposure or where it is. Um, and what's important to note is that we have, on the other hand, socioeconomic processes that feed into risk, like socioeconomic pathways, the adaptation actions and mitigation actions, and the existing governance structure. Um, how do we assess risk? We usually follow a framework for a climate risk situation. We represent the current system that we're studying. We represent the current climate of that system. And then we represent future climate changes, project future climate, and then project future climate impacts to the set system, and then identify and test adaptation and risk management solutions. Okay, now let's get into adaptation. These are some of the strategies that are needed today and are identified by this IPCC report. Again, these are some strategies that are many more. Uh, we have water management, which includes irrigation, rainwater storage, flood and drought management, improving food security, so just community-based adaptation, strengthening biodiversity, cultivar diversification which is really important for the ecosystems and the diversity of um, soil. Transfor transforming cities, which is green and blue spaces, disaster management programs, and capacity building at all levels, which means local knowledge, engaging all sectors and residents and creating awareness. And this is where I wanted to talk about the bottom-up approach um, and include community in uh, planning decisions and in creating solutions to really understand the local conditions. Maladaptation. So maladaptation is when a climate change adaptation action backfires and have opposite of the intended effect, or which means it increases vulnerability or reinforces existing inequality. For example, solutions around say agricultural modernization offered to only those who own the land versus those who work on the land can 
um, reinforce existing inequality and then in turn increase vulnerability of the already vulnerable populations. And studies show that if you don't address systemic inequalities when you're designing adaptation solutions, it can lead to division, conflict, and maladaptation and have unintended consequences. So there are limits to adaptations, of course, even effective adaptation cannot prevent all losses and damages above 1.5 degrees C of warming. Some natural solutions may no longer work because your earth system has already changed. Above 1.5 degrees C, lack of fresh water could mean that people living on small islands and those dependent on glaciers and snow melt can no longer adapt because of um, just having not, not, not having access. Um, by, two point, by 2 degrees C warming, it will be challenging to farm multiple staple crops in many current growing areas due to high heat. So accelerating adaptation, what does that mean? We need political commitment and follow through across all levels of government, institutional framework, enhancing knowledge of impacts and risk. And that can start with this, right? With creating awareness of climate change basics, understanding impacts, understanding risks, monitoring and evaluating of adaptation measures and uh, to track progress to make sure that you're not maladapting, to make sure that the solutions that you've offered are actually working. Um, and again, inclusive, go inclusive governance that prioritizes equity and justice. So what is mitigation? Some mitigation strategies, and again, some there are many, uh, include energy, which is direct reductions in fossil fuels, widespread use of renewables, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, in transportation, which can mean low carbon technology, electric vehicles, using alternative fuels. In cities and urban areas, it can mean better planning, green spaces, low emission construction, retrofitting buildings. In industries, on other industries, it can mean creating low waste and recycling. And in land use, it can mean protecting natural resources and ecosystems, which is important in nature-based solutions when looking at both adaptation and mitigation. So technology and innovation, it's important to invest in new technology, push forward low emission technology, invest in carbon renewal, remo uh, carbon removal technologies. Um, some options are technical vi technically viable and rapidly cost effective, but I think it's really important here to note that Adoption of low emission technologies is slower in most developing countries, particularly the least developed ones, and lack of resources, funding, and financial viability is really important here for all regions across the world. Policies, regulatory, and economic instruments uh, have already proven effective in reducing em emissions. It is really, really important for coordination across governments and society to have ambitious and effective mitigation strategies. Here are some of the adaptation actions and mitigation actions by NASA. In our climate action plan, we identify climate change related vulnerabilities and we develop what is called a risk reduction strategy. We are planning on modernizing our master plan to better integrate and adapt to climate risk. We are developing agency-wide resilience framework and center resilience plans that include um, resilience strategies, develop next generation climate models, which is the NASA GIS model that I talked about. Um, and just to expand understanding of Earth's climate system, we're trying, to connect, we're trying to create a connection between the climate science data and the GIS capabilities to identify and map asset level hazard exposure. On the mitigation side, um, the goal is to aggressively reduce emissions. The dominant aviation emission here, which is the GHG, uh, by uh, looking into alternative fuel technology. We are also looking in multiple energy consumption and efficiency projects, hosting solar PVs for energy usage, et cetera. 
Uh, and that's it. That's my last slide. Any questions and comments are welcome. This is a link to an entire training for climate change basics and also includes remote sensing data. If folks are interested to please go and take the training. And back to Christina. Thank you so much. That was a super interesting uh, presentation. And even for some of us who have kind of been in the climate world for a while, it's nice to kind of start from the beginning and, and, um, and hear the whole picture. So that was super helpful. Um, we did get some questions. I do want to start here. Um, so you mentioned a little bit of uncertainty and unpredictability. Are the models getting more accurate or less accurate because of the accelerating climate unpredictability? So the models are definitely improving over time. The major source of unpredictability, I would say, is the greenhouse gas emissions and forcings. What we don't know is what the path the world will take in the future. We know the climate science, we know the climate systems, we know the earth systems, and even though they are always in flux, they are changing, and it's the change that we've never seen before, the scientists are still very confident in modeling that the uncertainty really comes from the greenhouse gas emissions and the policy uh, pathways that we would take. Interesting, thank you. I guess this is kind of a build on to that question. Um, you were talking about the SSP and if you can remind us what the SSP is in your answer, I'm on the SSP storyline predictions. Are we currently on the taking the green road, the middle of the road, or a rocky road? And then what can we do to improve to ensure that we do end up on the green road? Well, <laughs> that's a loaded question, right? Uh, we really need to do a lot more to make sure we end up on the green road. We are currently, I, I wouldn't say we're on the business as usual, which was the high SSP 58.5. And, and let me just go back and say the SSP is the shared social economic pathways, which include not only the development pathways that the world will take, but the definition itself includes the combined uh, RCPs, which is the representative concentration pathways, which means that the greenhouse gas forcing. So it's a combined scenario with the development and the greenhouse gas forcing. Um, I hope that makes sense. Uh, and I would yeah definitely say that we are not on the business as usual or the high highest most scenario, um, which is, I don't know if it's a positive that we should look at, but uh, according to you know scientists and the latest literature, to be on that high most scenario, we, we would have to basically reopen coal plants and reopen most of our um, closed fossil fuel plants, which is not happening. So we're definitely not on that road, but we are also not on the lowest taking the green road. Um, so somewhere in between, we need to really, uh, yeah, we need to really get together and make some um, really um, heavy changes to our systems. Thank you. We can't go backwards, but we must go forwards, it sounds like. And it, um, I think having these conversations are one of those ways and making sure folks know what we're talking about when we're talking about climate, climate impacts and all these changes. So it's, I appreciate you answering these questions. Yeah, I think that's what's most important is to just create as much awareness as you can, you know, and push climate literacy. And it's, for us, it seems like, oh, it's a basic concept, but if you don't make people aware of what is actually happening to our system and the impacts that it can have, we don't really, well, sometimes, you know, I've seen people confuse um, recycling or air pollution with climate change. And then just having that distinction of, okay, greenhouse gas emissions impacting the climate system or having those definitions of words like weather is different than climate, global warming is different than climate change, just knowing those basic things really help. For sure, and I, I actually think um, folks, including myself, will be referencing your slides for some of those hazard risk exposure type um, information in the future. Um, speaking of those terms, another question that came in is, what is asset level hazard exposure? 
I think you said, what is asset level hazard exposure or hazard assessment, I think is what the phrase was. Oh, risk asset assessment, level. is that what we're talking about? I think the, the question might be typed funny, but I think it was, what is asset level hazard assessment? Is that what you used in one of your later slides? Oh, I think, yeah, but I was not talking about the NASA's plans. What we do is we um, look at what of our physical assets are exposed to climate risk. So it can be things like um, buildings or um, what is the extent of the equipments that the NASA facilities have. So operations and maintenance, but also equipments that are exposed to the climate risk. I hope that was the question and I'm answering it correctly. I'm not really sure, but we also look at assets. When you talk about asset exposure, we also look at people, you know, for example, the employees that come into our facilities to work um, in, in, in places like JPL and Ames when there's a wildfire have intense air quality risks. So even when they're working in a building, what is the exposure to bad air quality for the people working, but also for the buildings and the facilities and the equipment? Um, so I think that's that makes we, sense. Yeah. Yeah, I think that was the question, and I think you got into what an asset is, so that's that is helpful. Another question, if you're up for it, uh, sure. <laughs> what is the time scale for downscale GIS models are aiming to address? Still at thirty years, they're asking because public health planning is having a hard time managing ten-year time scales. So, is there progress in that direction? To, I guess to have. Uh, shorter time scale models. So yeah, I mean, I may not have explained this correctly in the slides, and that's a good feedback point. And I would change it in my slides to mention that models will actually project on daily um, time scales. So, for example, if I'm looking at uh, at the GIS climate model, I will have information which are daily outputs from. 1950 to 2100. So you can uh, look at the next two years, five years, 10 years, whatever time scale that you work on, but the outputs are available daily at, I want to say 27 kilometers. If you go to a regional model, that's the lowest you can go. But there are also for um, North America, lower resolutions, um, sorry, higher resolutions available. You have five kilometers. Um, available as well. It's called a LOCA model, but it's from the older CMIP-5 climate models, but they are available. So regional models go as low as five to six kilometers also, but they are daily. So you can, um, you know, if you want to look at temperatures or um, say extreme heat days in the next year, you can, in the next five years, in the next 10 years, you can definitely do that. Okay, so it, would it be correct to say that the global models are on the longer time scales and then the smaller you get in scale, you can do a little bit um, quicker or shorter duration, shorter time scale? Um, no, so the, the downscale regional models are also from 1950 to 2100, same, same temporal resolution. What's different is when you're forecasting weather, which is say, if it's gonna to rain tomorrow, those are weather models, those are not climate models. So there's there's a difference between uh, the different types of models that we're using. Thank you for clarifying. Um, okay, so another question, do we have opportunities to better engage with more diverse perspectives? For example, indigenous wisdom uh, and attention to the very help, helpful science and governance. So I guess, is there a way to draw on, upon ind, indigenous wisdom and experience and, and whatnot to inform the science and, and policy? Oh, definitely, uh, I, would, I would say yes. So personally, and I would say this first personally, I come from an agricultural community back in India and I really promote indigenous practices back from where I am. And we've seen this over time that those indigenous practices are sustainable, they're good for the environment, they're good for um, the crop yield as well. 
Um, so yeah, definitely. With the scientist side and the science information side, we um, do what we're called co-production and co-generation of information. And, and, and what that means really is that as scientists in a field of climate change, it's really important for us to take into account perspectives of planners, of different governments, of different community um, organizations to really understand the risk from a local perspective. And as scientists, what we really try to do is co-generate this information based on what is needed, what is required, but also how can we update the knowledge that you have and vice versa, right? Like you share your knowledge and we share our knowledge. And we really believe in the co-generation of climate and climate risk information, because there's no other way to really understand risk. That's an excellent answer. And yeah, that was that was an excellent answer. The co-generation of information, I think, is a really excellent way to capture and share information. Um, I, just a pause to say that for those of you who joined, um, joined us late or are just joining us, uh, we are capturing questions at the go green at hhs.gov email address. So please feel free to submit your questions to go green at hhs.gov. And in the future, if you'd like to see the whole video or to uh, share the recording later, um, the video will be posted to the Office of Climate Change and Health Equity webpage. Um, and if you can, please sign up for our um, listserv so that you can get the alert once the video is posted, because it does take a couple of days for us to get to uh, to get that process and posted. So send your email or send your questions via email to go green at hhs.gov and <laughs> sign up for a listserv so you know when the video is posted um, so you can rewatch and share. All right. Um, we have another question. There's actually a couple more, a few more questions. What, sure. approach does, <laughs> what approach does NASA take to climate change that may be different from other agencies like NOAA and HHS? Um, so I had a slide on this, on the actions that we take, both on adaptation and mitigation side. I, as a scientist, really work on the climate modeling space and the climate impact research space. Um, and I would say that, um, you know, as I don't know what actions the HHS takes or the NOAA or the other federal agency takes, I know definitely NOAA works a lot in sea level rise, um, but yeah, I think for us, climate modeling is um, and remote sensing missions, right? Like you are able to, in real time, um, not only observe the actual impacts and changes, but also study them and analyze. So through the satellites and the missions. So I think that would be a difference. And I don't really, yeah, I don't really know how to answer that question. <laughs> No, I think it's, it's a tough question. Um, if I can help extend your answer a little bit, I guess that I guess it would be what you said, and, and everybody, all these different departments and agencies are working within their missions and mandates um, yeah. to answer the questions within their purview as it pertains to climate um, climate change. So at HHS, you know, we're thinking about health, where others are thinking about what are the systems that um, that are changing and measuring and modeling and um, and whatnot. So that was a great answer. And we definitely uh, want to promote interagency interactions, right? Because we can always learn from each other and share data and share knowledge. Absolutely. And it all builds on each other, which is why we're so happy that you're here to talk with us today. Um, all right. Uh, are there any studies that predict potential for food production to move north as climate warms? So that's a great question. Um, I wouldn't say off the top of my head it's moving north, but um, I can, and this is such a scientist thing to do, but I can cite or give a link to this paper that a colleague of mine worked on last year, which really uh, projected the changes in crop yield for maize um, and wheat for a global production and how it changes regionally. And this was for the high scenarios. So this is for the SSP 5, 
and you know every time we project we have to follow a certain scenario we have to um, see the projections for what will it be for the lowest emission intermediate emission high emission because really we don't know where we will end up so for the high scenario this paper really talks about the changes in crop yield and it's very interesting to see that in 2050 or 2070s 2080s some of these regions will see an actual increase in production and some will see a decrease in production and i will love i would love to send that paper um, it's by jonas jaeger meyer if you want to google it and um, there's a really pretty graph and i should have probably included it in the presentation of the um, the production of the global um, map and you can see the changes in yield for um, wheat and maize so that's an interesting question we do have a lot of studies. Yes, definitely, if you're more interested, there is AGMIP, A-G-M-I-P section of our group. It's at NASA GIS, and they only study on food production and crop systems. So they'll have a lot more studies that you can look at. Awesome, thank you. And if you share the paper with us, we can see if we can link to it in um, our listserv announcement when it goes out. All right, uh, let's see. Do the climate models factor in potential tipping points like great glacier melt and deforestation? Yeah, so they do definitely uh, factor in. And by factor in, I mean they will predict and try to project um, those tipping points. Like I said, for when we're talking about the Atlantic circulation, the models aren't predicting it for at least the next 100 years. Um, so when we are modeling the existing climate system and when we're looking at particular tipping point, we try to gauge uh, what's the current status and how it will change in the future. But again, it all depends on really what the warming levels are, right? Like when we were looking at the Atlantic circulation, the scientists and the models only see it completely shutting down or failing only after we reach a certain degree of warming. So what the, again, the uncertainty around tipping points really comes from where we are, what the level of warming is, um, and how the systems will react to that level of warming, wherever, which, whichever path we follow into the future. Awesome, thank you. Um, I'm just trying to interpret the next question. I think I know what the question is. Um, does NASA have a carbon capture group or engage engage in carbon capture research? Well, not that I know, that's a good question. I, if they do, then I really need to find out, but not that I'm aware of. Awesome, okay. Let us know if you find out. <laughs> Um, okay, so how can, I like this question, how can the younger generation school kids participate in your program? If, is there any website information that you can share or just your email? Yeah, that's such a great question. Oh my God. Um, so like I had the last link on my slide, which is called the RSET, A-R-S-E-T, RSET training. And they have a bunch of different trainings on, um, you know, impact of climate change, what does remote sensing satellite data tell us about climate systems? But the, the actual training is called climate, um, climate change basics and remote sensing or something like that. But there's a whole two-part training on just the kind of thing that I showed you right now, which might be a little too much for school kids. Um, there is another program through NASA GIS um, it's called CCRI Initiative, where they actually go and teach or create awareness or give these trainings to K-12 teachers. And the teachers, in turn, then um, try to talk about it in their classes. So we do have this program, um, which a lot, a lot of it is involved with training the teachers and training the um, high school teachers and K-12, I think. But yeah, we do have those programs. That's awesome. I think you said CCRI is the teacher. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they have a K-12 program and I can get more information on that definitely. Okay. And do you want to show the last slide um, where you had that information while I kind of set up the next question? 
actually. Awesome. So that's what it's called. It's the introduction to NASA resources for climate change applications, but it has, it's a two part one. So the first is all climate basics. It's a lot more information. It talks a lot more about using models, but also remote sensing. And they give a lot more examples, which can be really um, tangible to understand. That's awesome. Thank you. Um, let's see, I think we have time for at least one more question. Um, this has to do with changes from the pandemic. So during the last two years of the pandemic, many people have been working from home instead of driving to work. Has this had a measurable and maybe positive impact on uh, atmospheric gases and compositions? Yeah, there has been. So there's this thing called the Keeling curve, uh, which was started by the scientist John Keeling, I think. Um, and what it does in the in Hawaii's Mauna Loa, uh, lab, what it does is really measures the amount of CO2 concentration in the atmosphere. Um, and they updated every day. So there was a little tiny dip in 2020, but we're up again. <laughs> so um, didn't really make quite a lot of difference. It's a tiny little dip, but you can definitely see that, you know, um, the pandemic had some sort of impact there was there were studies i'm not studies but obviously i mean i have family in delhi that we we saw a difference in the air quality because delhi now has the worst air quality um it's one of the cities that has worst air quality and during the pandemic it had um really slightly improved um but yeah that was some of those observations that people saw in their day to day life it's little changes but i think we reverted back <laughs> to what we were before very quickly excellent uh, thank you so much i i think we all learned a lot today and from both your personal experience and also your pro professional um, experience, research, and expertise. So thank you so much for coming today. Um, thank you to all the folks who signed on and joined us. Um, really appreciate the attention and time and the questions coming in. Um, before we close out, I do want to remind everybody to join us the same time tomorrow to hear from climate scientist and award-winning science communicator, Tom DeLiberto uh, from NOAA, who will discuss climate change impacts, adaptation, and resilience. And on Thursday, also at noon, to hear from our very own uh, from HHS, Dr. John Balbus, who is the Interim Director of the Office of Climate Change and Health Equity, and he will discuss uh, the climate change and health equity at HHS. Um, thank, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. It was fun, and all the questions were great. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. You are awesome. Thank you so much. Have an excellent day, and I hope everybody has an excellent um, Earth Day week. Bye, everyone. Bye. Have a good day. Produced by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services.